from the global headquarters of the Asgard Company in beautiful downtown Wichita Falls, Texas. From the finest mind in the modern fitness industry, the one true voice of the strength and conditioning profession, the most important podcast on the internet, ladies and gentlemen, Starting Strength Radio. Welcome back to Starting Strength Radio. Thank you, Mark Wolf, for that wonderful introduction. We are here with our friend Robert Santana today. Robert is a registered dietitian. He runs our nutrition board on uh, the website. And uh, Robert is, uh, uh, let's see, you've got a master's degree in X science, X phys. I know that's important to your current practice. And... (laughs) And uh, and you are uh, a diet and nutrition counselor and uh, works online. Look him up. But first, uh, Robert, tell us about a gallon of milk a day. Well, Rip, I think it's important that the audience knows that 100% of human beings on planet Earth And also, people in space need to drink a gallon of milk a day for the rest of their life. What about their dogs and cats? Them too. Same thing. Cats need two gallons. I completely agree. Cats don't get enough milk. No. Okay. Well, I wanted to get that out of the way. Okay. uh, Because uh, everyone knows. Oh, yeah. That uh, starting strength requires that everyone drink a gallon of milk a day. Yeah. we, we, this is so incredible. We, we talked about this in a previous podcast. Nick pulled this thing out and uh, posted it on Thursday, the twenty seventh of uh, of uh, what is it? June Thursday, the twenty seventh of June. Yeah. And uh, a little three and a half minute clip up, and he cleverly titled it. Uh, what, what did you say? You must drink a gallon of milk a day? Everyone. Everyone must drink a gallon of milk a day. Mm-hmm. And the video uh, basically said, well, here's a, here's a portion of the video. Stress, don't drink the shit. Nobody told you you had to drink milk. Are you people still belaboring under the, laboring under the delusion that I want everybody on the surface of the planet to drink a gallon of milk a day? Good God, get over that. That's so 12 years ago, you know. We've never said that, and that's stupid. And if you think that, you're a fool. I don't drink milk. I hadn't drunk milk in 30 years. I'm not trying to grow. Now, it it must be obvious uh, what the intent of that video was. But what we did was intentionally... uh, play with the bottom 3% on YouTube. And uh, those are the people who comment on YouTube videos. Bottom 3% are, are your commenters. And uh, this also applies to Facebook. And uh, uh, I swear to God, within 10 minutes of having put this thing up, we must have had 20 comments. Ripito is still pushing that gallon of milk a day thing. Ripping toes, fat. Everybody doesn't need to drink a gallon of milk a day. Come off it, man. You know. The best people, one is, I people, really respect Ripping toes opinion on strength training. But. But. <laughs> but. He says everybody should drink a gallon of milk a day. And it's just it's just amazing. Uh, Glenn Reynolds. Uh, for our friend at Instapundit has a has a new little book out. It's a pamphlet, and he makes the case in this pamphlet that uh, social media has changed our brains. Mm-hmm. Now think about this, I, and, and I think that you'll uh, you'll find that this really is true. Uh, it's changed mine. 
it has shortened our attention span. Mm -hmm. uh, my ability to sit down and read a book without interruption is essentially been obliterated. It's, it's a lot of trouble. I have to be in a certain set of circumstances before I can sit down and read uninterrupt, uninterrupted seven paragraphs out of a oh, book shit. without looking around for something else. And social media did that to us. It's done it to all of us. It has changed uh, public discourse for the worse. Uh, it's exposed us to a whole bunch of information, but the nature of the presentation is such that you read a headline and you form an opinion based on the headline, the first two sentences of the, of the piece. Nobody reads the whole thing. These idiots on Facebook are reading the title. It's a video, for God's sakes. It's not even an article. It's a fucking video. They're reading the title of the video and starting to type without even looking at the video. And it's just, it's just fascinating to watch this. It really is. Uh, these people have no idea what the video said. It's a blatant condemnation of the idea that everybody has to drink a gallon of milk a day. And within 10 minutes, there are 15 or 20 comments that indicate that, right, you people think that we said that. And we've never said it. And it's just, it's just funny. It, it, it's terribly, com it's just comical as hell. And, uh, oh, before we get into our discussion with Robert today, we've got a, we've got a new video, a new, a new feature on the podcast. Comments, Comments from, the, from the, haters. the haters. In my humble opinion, I am H.O., this is very bad form. Looks horrible for the lower back. However, I have no clue and might be totally mistaken here. <laughs> oh, God. You got to read that. This is Walter Sobchak, by, <laughs> by the way. And what video is he it, commenting on? He's commenting on the Barbell Row video, revisiting the Barbell Row. In my humble opinion, this is very bad form. Looks like horrible. Looks horrible for the low back. However, I have no clue and might be totally mistaken here. No Vietnam. Why would comment. you? Why would you type that? All right, Ted T A D G H Smith says, "I haven't watched the video yet. This is the back pain episode video. I haven't watched the video yet. But if the teacher is half crippled with back pain." form doing the thing he teaches, I'm wondering, do I really need to learn it? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> These are so goddamn funny. <laughs> Could you put Walter Sobchak's gun picture up? <laughs> I, I, I assure you that we're more amused by your comments than you are amused when you make them. All right. All right, here is Coping Doomer who says, and this is the first three questions, audio only. I read the first three questions as, a, as an audio article. This diet advice is stupid. Come on, man. 4,000 calories, really, brah. I'm only 184 centimeters. And there, one word, is no way in hell I can eat that much without ending up fat. Credit to the strong, fat lads. I respect what you guys do, but I don't want to look you. If that means sacrificing strength, then so be it. He's in no danger. He's in, no, too no, bad. too strong. Too strong. Coping, if you get too strong, we'll give you your money back. Like right. you're too rich. Money back guarantee. Too rich. Yeah. Right. All right, here's this is this we got to stop. Christoph says this is the strength allows you to run. Uh, start to drink clips. This is a clip out of a deal, right? This is from Grant, I believe, right? So. Bruggy's video. It says, prove it, Rip. Let's see you run, motherfucker. LOL. <laughs> ah! 
Oh yeah, wait, no, yeah. All right, let me let me find it. Nick says I have to read the nipple one. Let me see if I can find this guy. Uh, maybe that's on the back page. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> this one is from uh, a person by the by the name of Nof No Fap Gamer G. He doesn't fap apparently. No fan. We don't believe you. <laughs> to wit. Why are Mark's nipples hard? <laughs> Is he some kind of pervert? <laughs> yeah, no fap. I'm I'm the pervert that's watching your nipples. Oh god damn. What a what a situation. All right, now all of that having been said, Robert, thanks for showing up today. Robert lives in Phoenix. And what we're going to do today is kick around some basic concepts that are important to all of you people who are not currently typing on the internet about the gallon of milk a day comments earlier. Uh, So let's just approach this in broad general terms, all right? When people are concerned about nutrition associated with training, they are worried about one of two things. They are worried about losing body fat or gaining muscle mass, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. So let's talk about those two things and how they're interrelated because this is terribly important. Well, let's start with the uh, the gallon of milk. Yeah, right. Let's start with a gallon of milk. Since it applies to everybody. Everyone on everybody. Everybody needs to. You so know, your mother, your grandmother, your grandmother's grandmother, your grandmother's grandmother, your dead ancestors, your dead ancestors, mm-hmm. your dogs, your cats, mm-hmm. insects. Right. Um, so as you were talking, it was running through my mind. How this originated and why this is appropriate. I know you beat this to hell, but we should probably beat it to hell again. Let's do it again yeah. just for the sake of, uh, uh, you know, clarification here. So, um, in an alternate universe, you know, not here, of course, a gallon of milk a day is appropriate for who? The 18-year-old underweight boy. Yes. That wants to get big and strong. That's right. Six feet three, 140 pounds. That's him. Yeah, he needs the gallon That's of milk. That's him. 5'11". 155. That couldn't be who the only person we're talking about. We're talking about everybody. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're yeah. talking about, but but really? Yeah. Uh, you people, get your heads out of your yeah. ass, okay? Mm-hmm. We're not, you know. Yeah. The gallon of milk a day has worked beautifully throughout history, mm-hmm. certainly throughout the past hundred years of barbell history, uh, for putting weight on underweight young males. That's all it's for. That's all it's for. We've never said it was for anybody else. But how does it work? Okay, so the guy who's 6'3", 130, is probably not eating enough food, probably has a faster metabolic rate that's a you know, longer body, longer human body. Right. Taller people tend to burn more calories, right? Yes. And does, does gut length have anything to do with this? How much variation is there in, in gut length? Not very much. That's that's fairly yeah. standard across. There aren't people with short guts and long guts. Not by a way. Because that was yeah. bandied about, you know, for years yeah. as well. People with somebody with a short ilium has got, you know, not as much capacity to absorb nutrition than right. someone with a normally long one. But I don't know how much variation there are. It's, there's, Have you ever looked into that? There's outliers, of course, because we sure. deal, you know, I get a lot. There of, are always yeah. outliers. Yeah, but in general, it's probably not right. very much. Not a factor, really. So I want to ask you, since you've been around this longer, from a from an income perspective, who historically trained fifty years ago? From an income perspective, yeah. people who could afford it, because right. fifty years ago, yeah. manual labor substituted right for for everybody's physical load because we didn't have the internet. People didn't work online. Mm-hmm. People did. Most people are sedentary. Really, most people are sedentary now. Most productive people are sedentary. Uh, most people that have accomplished anything in their life are not out moving dirt with a shovel. Right. Right? That's not true of everyone, but, you know, and that's not to say that there aren't 
people who have a shovel job that aren't bright people, but mm-hmm. the economy mm-hmm. has shifted in the direction of sedentary right. in terms of daily activities. That okay. can't be argued with. So who was powerlifting and Olympic lifting in the 60s, 70s, 80s? Was, would you say it's a rich man sport? No, I would say it was uh, uh, not necessarily a rich man sport at all. No, that wasn't my, wasn't my experience. Uh, the uh, uh, people back then that were uh, competing as lifters in either Olympic lifting or powerlifting, I would say on the whole were – more intelligent than the normal mm-hmm. that you know i i'm sorry if that mm-hmm. fucks up your little stereotype but mm-hmm. that's that's mm-hmm. the most of the guys that mm-hmm. were at meets were brighter people mm-hmm. yes that were were uh, interested in physical culture for one reason or another right, right, and right. were and being in that uh in that demographic i think they had uh uh they were curious about things. They tried a lot of different mm-hmm. things. And, and this gallon of milk a day thing mm-hmm. was one of the ways you got from 181 to 220. Mm-hmm. So, you know? yeah. So where I was going with that is milk is highly cost effective for the amount of nutrients in it. It certainly is. Yeah. It doesn't have to be cooked. Yeah. It's, it's, it's available yeah. commercially as a homogenized, mm-hmm. pasteurized product. Nobody gets sick drinking it. Mm-hmm. It's it's perfectly safe. It's cheap. It's quantifiable. Right? Yep. Comes in convenient measured portions. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's available all over the place. Every convenience store right. has milk. Now, does the 18-year-old boy have money? Not usually. Not usually. Not yeah. usually. There's exceptions, but not usually, right? Right. So in today's dollars, a gallon of milk is about $3. Depending on where, if you're in a bigger you know, city, isn't that yeah. fascinating? Yeah. Uh, we bought a gallon of milk mm-hmm. uh, at Walmart last night because I have to drink a gallon of milk a day. Yeah, yeah. right. Mm-hmm. I drink a gallon of milk a day. Yeah, still, it's what I, everybody does. Steph drinks a gallon yeah. of milk a day. Oh, yeah. Each one of the dogs drink a gallon of milk a day. Right. Yeah. And uh, a gallon of milk was a dollar forty-seven. Nice. At Walmart. Yeah. Perfectly good milk, gallon, dollar forty-seven. Not bad. So yes, yeah. this is one of the important reasons we recommend it. It is cost effective. Mm-hmm. And for that dollar forty-seven to three dollars, depending on which market you're in, you get one hundred and ninety-two grams of carbohydrates. You get, if it's whole milk, you get about one hundred and twenty-eight grams of fat and one hundred and twenty-eight grams of protein for a total of twenty-four hundred calories for. A dollar fifty for a dollar forty-seven. Yeah. Right, that can't you can't do that with any other substance. Nope, not of that quality. You can't do that with any other substance. You know, it's uh, that's a complete you know, meal. <laughs> eggs are more expensive than that, although not much more expensive. I'm paying a dollar thirty-eight for eighteen eggs at Walmart. Those of you that are too good to shop at Walmart, you, know, you people, you, you know how silly you are. You, you know, you know, how, you know how silly that makes you, in terms of just realistically working your way through your budget. That's just stupid. Shop at Walmart; it's cheaper. Yeah. My God, the produce department at Walmart is usually better because it changes over so fast they've stepped it up too it didn't used to be the case no no they do a great job yeah they really do they do a great job and it's fresh Mm -hmm. because it doesn't stay there very long they do do the Mm just-in-time inventory management Mm -hmm. with their produce too it's uh Mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a you know if you're not shopping at walmart because you think it it's not cool well just you know go ahead and spend too much Fine with us. I shop at Walmart 15 years now. Oh, yeah. I, I go at 1 in the morning, so yeah. I don't have to look at the freaks, you know. People it is look. funny about 4 in the afternoon. No. <laughs> People oh, my God. Yeah, it's a, but, you know, yep. it, that, that's part of, that's just entertainment. Mm-hmm. That's part of the entertainment, man. So, the inter- so yeah. anyway. Interesting thing is, even if you're getting ripped off and spending the $3 at Whole Foods or wherever you're going. Yeah. Um, 
it's still cheaper than any other substance really? because you're getting all three macronutrients, your carbs, right. your fats, your proteins, for a dollar fifty to three dollars, depending right. on where you are shopping. Right. So if you're looking at the eighteen year old kid that lives in mom's basement and he's not spoiled, it's a pretty good deal. It's a damn good yeah. deal. And there's it just works very, very well. Yeah. It's a it's a handy handy solution to a problem uh, that it, that an underweight young man may have. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say if you're an underweight young man, you have a problem. You don't want to be underweight, and you need to, to economically solve the problem, and that's why we say the gallon of milk a day, because for that demographic, it works. And you don't have to wonder whether it's going to work. You know it's going it, to work. It's going to work. Yeah. If you don't want to do it, you don't like milk, whatever, I don't care. I don't care. Stay underweight, please. Stay underweight. Stay skinny. Stay pathetic. Stay diseased looking. Pursue your heroin chic wardrobe <laughs> situation however you'd like to. But if, you, if you've got enough sense to understand that you look better big and strong, then that's how you get that way. Yeah. Okay. Now, that having been said, uh, for most other people, uh, milk is a part of, uh, it can be a part of a dietary approach, depending on whether you're doing one of these two things, losing weight, losing body fat, I'm sorry, or gaining muscular body weight. So let's approach let's approach the, the 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 first of those two options first. This is commonly regarded as something called a cut. Mm -hmm. On the internet you're doing a cut. A cut. You're doing a cut. So how how should that be accomplished? You forgot to do the a cut. Yeah. yeah my, <laughs> Air quotes. <laughs> I like to do them this way. Everybody wants me to do them this way, but I don't. So, how yeah. do you? What do you? How do you do the cut? Well, a cut refers to if somebody hires you mm -hmm. to do a cut. Mm -hmm. All right, to to plan a cut for yeah. them. First off, who should that person be? What are their What are their their uh, statistics going to be? Mm -hmm. And how should they accomplish that? They should be a obese. So BMI greater than 30, body okay. mass index, you can look up that equation and see if you fall into that. Right. Holds accurate for most novices. That's right. fair to say. Because they're sedentary people. Uh, the BMI inaccuracies kick in when, you know, you start getting some training. The, the on your longer body. you yeah. train, the more useless BMI becomes. Yeah. But at first, for the general population, it works pretty well. So BMI greater than right. 30, you should probably cut some weight. Um, number two, an intermediate or advanced lifter who's gained a bunch of weight because he's trying to build muscle. He needs to lose a bunch of weight and do it again. Right. Okay. Um, and those are pretty much the only two circumstances where I think now, now an intermediate advanced lifter. Mm -hmm. Say this again. Let's let's be clear what we're talking about. You're mm -hmm. talking about a guy who is trying to stay in a weight class. I'm talking about a guy who has gained a bunch of body weight. To build muscle. Right, for the purpose of building muscle. And and now he wants to, to cut body fat percentage back down. Yeah, so he can do it again. Right. Oh, I see what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. Okay. So you this, this doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the weight class, but it might. That's the third situation. Sure. Right, weight well, class yeah. weight class sports. Weight class sports. So I think it's uh, – let's stop right now and discuss this fundamental, this fundamental thing because – you may be so deeply immersed in this that you're not going to address it, and I want to make sure it gets okay. addressed. Anytime you gain body weight, you will have gained both muscle mass and body fat. Mm -hmm. And anytime you lose body weight, that loss will be composed of both lean body mass and body fat. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, Why? Because, because because you have to understand this, or the rest of this conversation doesn't make any sense to you. You cannot, like they say on the internet, gain muscle mass and not gain some body fat in the process. Now you can skew the 
mm-hmm. the process in the direction that you want it to go. But, yeah. But anabolic processes are. You gain fat, you gain muscle. They're inextricably related. Yes. That's what you said years ago. Why is that? Because anytime you are in an energy surplus, which means that you're gaining, you're consuming more calories than you're expending. So you got maintenance surplus deficit. So let's say you expend or burn, burn 3,000 calories a day, and you eat 2,500, you are in a deficit. You are likely to lose body weight, which means you're likely to lose muscle mass and fat mass. We're all clear on this, right? Right. If you are eating 3,500 calories and your baseline is 3,000, you're going to gain fat mass and muscle mass. Now, excess calories without training are going to be converted into fat. With training, less of them will be converted into fat, but there's no getting around that. In fact, Mm -hmm. uh, if you sit on the couch Mm -hmm. and with Coke and potato chips, Mm -hmm. add 100 pounds to your body weight. Some of that's going to be muscle mass. Of course. Isn't that crazy? They don't believe that, though. Yeah. They well, don't They don't believe what I just said is true. But that's absolutely true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because anabolic processes are growth processes, and everything grows. So, yeah, anytime you gain body weight, you're gaining fat and muscle. Right. Anytime you lose body weight, you're losing fat and muscle. It's just the way the thing works. Now... Um, why does it work that way? Well, we don't really know exactly why. But we know that excess calories means excess body fat no matter what. You're going to gain muscle mass sitting on your ass getting fat, assuming that you know, you're know you doing some sort of movement because you have to support a larger body mass. That's one mm. potential reason why. You know, These professional research people can't really measure this stuff, contrary to what they tell right. you. No, you no, know? I know they can't. Yeah. Uh, the nutrition science, yeah. published nutrition science, yeah. is almost as bad as published exercise science, if that's possible. I would say it's worse. Really? Yeah, I would say it's really? worse, yeah, and I'll tell you why it's worse. Because they can't measure the thing that they're trying to measure. They can't reliably – let's scratch that. They, they do not have a valid or reliable way to measure these things. Right. Because – In the same way that exercise science tries to use – surface emg to measure motor unit recruitment that's equivalent to self-reported it's, diet intake right it's it's just bullshit yeah. so it's, it's yeah. not good data 99 percent of professional nutrition research that has been published is bs because they cannot measure what people are eating and then they're extrapolating right. based on what people are saying they're eating so we have several decades worth of peer-reviewed papers that say this diet works or this mineral works or this you know, this macronutrient breakdown works or this supplement works when they can't even measure what the person's they eating. They don't actually yeah. know what intake no. and output is going on. They can't yeah. measure intake. No. Because it's all self-reported. Mm-hmm. And they can't measure output because they don't know how to measure output. No. no. Right. So until they can find a meaningful way to measure that, we really don't know what's going on. We right. know that people are saying they're eating this. You're giving them... So they're saying they're eating X, we're giving them Y, and then we're seeing Z happen. But do we know it's because of the dietary intervention right. or something else? You know, you give somebody a supplement, they could start changing their diet. Involuntary things happen when you're in a research study. Yeah. You know? Interesting things happen when you start spending $300 a month on supplements. Yeah. Maybe that you start training harder in the gym. Or you start eating cleaner. Or you start eating cleaner or, or some, other, you some have, other thing. So yeah. this is a situation in which mm-hmm. we've got, uh, uh, a lot of misunderstanding in the public. So mm-hmm. to, to, to back up, mm-hmm. anytime you gain body weight, mm-hmm. you're gaining both body fat and lean muscle mass, mm-hmm. lean body mass, as it's called. Yes. And anytime you lose weight, you're losing body fat mm-hmm. and lean muscle mass. Mm-hmm. And you can shove those percentages in a certain direction. Of course. But the process of losing and gaining involves all of the body. Yes. All of the systems of the body, both the the adiposity Mm -hmm. and the lean body mass as well. So that just comes back to your original question, why that is. So weight change is driven primarily by calories, calories consumed. 
Mm -hmm. liquid consumed to sodium consumed, but generally calories, right? Mm -hmm. Then when you're talking about skewing it, that's where the macros come in and your training. So let me, let me, let me uh, really hit that point hard. If you're trying to skew this thing towards muscle, you have to train. Yes. And that's not going in the gym, doing a bunch of, you know, box jumps and right. waving you know, the dumbbells, wall right. sits, waving the dumbbells. Yeah. Right. You have to actually train. And by train, you have to progressively overload the weight on the bar. Right. Whether it's 15 reps, 25 singles, triples, it has to get heavier. You have to mm. do more over time than you previously were able to do if you're trying to skew this thing. So that's variable number one. When it comes to the lean mass variable, and by lean mass, I'm really referring to the muscular portion of the lean mass because not all lean mass is muscle, and we'll right. come back to that. Right. You have to train. You have to train hard. Okay? There's no mass diet in the absence of hard training Right. because that floats around. I get people right. that hire me. They're doing 30 minutes of CrossFit, and they're like, can you give me a mass diet? Like, no. 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 You have to train. No, no. no. You so, have to actually train. So variable number one, training. I think I hit that pretty well there. Variable number two is the macros. So you got protein first. Anybody who's walked in the gym has been told they need to eat more protein by all sides of the spectrum here in terms of professionals. The professional research people say it. We say it. The gym bros say it. How much is where people argue, but you need more protein than a sedentary person if you are training. We've heard for decades from the medical community that nobody needs more than 60 grams of protein a day. And, you know, every every slack-jawed fuck that walked through medical school comes out of the comes out of the, the the process and expert on everything about the human body. And they've said this for years and years. Uh, just exactly how firm is the the data on the relationship between training, the increase in lean muscle mass, and protein intake? How firm is it? What How firm that? is that data? Well, it indicates that you need more. All of it does. Most of it, yeah, all of it. Are there yeah, any yeah. conflicting opinions on I that? I don't think that's point? disputable. Right. I don't think any peer-reviewed paper, because that's what we're talking about yeah. here, has suggested that 0. 0.8 grams per kilogram is enough for a lifter. Right. They've had position papers on this. They agree that you need more than that baseline. Right. So but, that's yeah. been done away with. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Finally, that's yeah. been done away with. I have a friend who has a friend uh, in the commercial, large-scale pork production industry. This is interesting, right? And this man is in the business mm -hmm. of generating protein. And his advice mm -hmm. to my friend is eat as much protein as you can eat Per day, mm -hmm. he said a minimum for a normal sized human male of three hundred grams of protein a day, and he's of the opinion, it, having been in this business for a while, that absolutely dietary protein drives the increase in lean muscle mass. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's incontrovertible. Mm -hmm. It's the way the industry operates, mm -hmm. and I'll we'll talk about that later because you. You need to talk to this guy. Oh, yeah. Anyway. So the next macronutrient would be carbohydrates. So the type of training that we do, resistance training, barbell training, we're lifting weights. You can't burn fat effectively when you're lifting weights. And without going into all the instrumentation and how this has been measured, um, typically the type of activity you do dictates which, macronu which macronutrient predominates, so which one you're burning most of. Now, you're never burning zero, so you're never burning right. zero fat or zero carb or zero protein, contrary to how this stuff is kind of spun in the you know, right. mass media. So when you're lifting, you're primarily burning um, creatine phosphate first, and then as the training session goes on or as you're doing more reps, you start to tap into glycogen, which is your stored right. carbohydrate. So this is why carbohydrate— We're talking about the energy substrate for the contraction, yeah. muscle contraction. Exactly, exactly. So one of the— arguments that i've heard from a professional researcher was well you don't you don't need carbs for lifting because you're just using creatine creatine phosphate but maybe for a single set then you start reading through their own data and you kind of see that 
each set, you're breaking down a little more glycogen, and it's never an all-or-nothing thing either. Well, you've got to replace the creatine phosphate that you just burned in the set mm-hmm. with something. Exactly. I mean, we've got to replace ATP. Mm-hmm. How do we replace it? Next one would be carbs. Right. Yeah. So by the end of a workout, you've broken down some glycogen. Now, it's not glycogen depleting like running a marathon. Right. You know, you're not going to completely wipe yourself out unless you're on a low-carb diet. More on that later. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's your next most important macronutrient is your carbs. And then you got fat. And you obviously using some because no matter what, it's never zero. So I don't want to say you're not burning any fat when you're lifting, just not very much. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't directly contribute to performance in the weight room or the increase in lean body mass. Right. Yeah. But I think it's important to note, since we're talking about fat, that there are uh, components of fats that function as micronutrients as well, mm-hmm. essential fatty acids. So when you say fat... Fat-soluble vitamins. You're, you're right. talking about not just the macronutrient that, that generates... Mm-hmm calories for the production of atp Mm -hmm. you're talking about other biological biologically Mm -hmm. active Mm -hmm. components of of the diet Mm -hmm. that can only be obtained from the fat portion of the diet there aren't any essential carbohydrates there are essential fatty acids that's correct right and that's also where you get your fat soluble vitamins your vitamin a your vitamin d your vitamin e and your vitamin k right vitamin k also comes from plant-based sources as well Mm mm-hmm but the first three are primarily found in oils and various um, high-fat foods. Right. So we're clear on that. So I'll tell you the general recommendation first, and then okay. I'll tell you how I've been doing it. Generally, right. if you have somebody who needs to lose body fat, the argument is made that they need more protein than if they weren't losing body fat, than if they were in an energy surplus or an energy maintenance. And the reason for that is because... This person's at risk of doing what? Losing muscle mass. So the higher protein intake and the proper training manipulation will help skew that muscle loss closer to zero. Right. Okay? Um, because we're losing both. Uh, yeah. Muscle mass and body fat when we lose weight. Yes, exactly. So remember, what drives muscle mass when you're gaining muscle? Protein intake, carbohydrate intake, and above all that, the training stimulus. Right. So your training needs to be manipulated properly. And your protein intake needs to stay high so that you can manipulate that number closer to zero. Okay? Right. Um, I don't change protein intake because I feed people plenty of protein either way. Right. You know, so if you've read my article on the Starting Strength website, typically men, 150 to 250 grams of protein with some outliers that are higher than 250. I don't think I've ever put a male under 150 unless they're a patient with kidney disease, Mm -hmm. pre-dialysis kidney disease. Mm Mm-hmm. So 150 to 250 grams of protein. So if you got a guy who's eating 200, 220 when he's gaining weight, he could probably lose weight just fine, provided his training programming is manipulated properly and not lose a bunch of muscle mass. Right. So that's how we manipulate protein during fat loss. Now, the other two is where people start to get into arguments, low carb versus low fat, this and that. Right, right. So what drives fat loss? Calorie deficit. Right. You have to reduce the amount of calories you're eating or increase the amount of calories you're expending. You have to be in a negative energy balance, which means you are burning more calories than you're taking than in. you are consuming. Yeah, yeah. so there's sure. two ways to do that. You can do a bunch of activity and expend more and eat the same, or you can start reducing calories. Usually the latter is the more preferred approach because we're not going to run around all day for eight hours unless we're— Well, know, and if we do, it adversely affects our strength. Right? Exactly. That was the next thing I was going right. to say. Because people who do that are typically NBA players, you know, NFL, mm-hmm. professional athletes, you know. Right. Um, so you reduce calories. So now you have to keep protein the same or increase it. So either carbs or fat have to go down. Right. So remember what we talked about earlier. If you're trying to build muscle mass, you need the carbohydrates to get through your training. So that's typically not the first thing that I reduce calories from if they're not losing, if they need to lose weight. Right. We cut the fat first. Right. And then when that stops working, then you start cutting the carbs. So the idea is you want to lose body fat on as many carbohydrates and protein grams as possible. To, right. To skew that muscle loss number towards zero. Do you have uh, any problems with a radical reduction in fat intake in terms of 
the macronutrient effects of essential fatty acids? Not that I've observed. Okay. I wouldn't be able to attribute it to that because I'll, you know. Take some fish oil. Yeah. Oh, do I recommend? Would you, oh, yeah, yeah, would yeah. You have them take some so that's a supplement on. question. Yeah, right. Yeah, you would take. So there's certain things you want to take on right. a cut. So because you're cutting calories, therefore you're cutting food. Because right. you're cutting food, you're cutting micronutrients, right. essential fatty acids, vitamins, minerals. So right. I've so t- yeah. supplement them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you supplement some essential fatty acids right. or fish oil. You take some multivitamins because yeah. you're gonna maybe not be at a huge deficiency and get something like scurvy, but you're eating less than you typically would. Be, right. You know. And especially in people that have lower calorie needs on a cut. So if I get a small lady that needs to eat 1,300 calories to cut, she needs to take some supplements during that period of time. Mm -hmm. Just to make sure the micro nutrient intake stays where it needs to be for recovery. Precisely. Right. Yeah. So uh, on the other hand, Mm -hmm. we got a guy that's 155 pounds. He's Mm 5'11". He needs to gain some some body weight. He needs to gain some body weight. He needs to gain some lean body mass, Mm -hmm. but how concerned are we about the body composition of an underweight 5'11", 155-pound, 18-year-old kid as he gains body mass? We're not very concerned at all. He's 150 pounds at 6'4". We got a problem. So he needs to gain weight. He needs to gain fat. He needs to gain muscle. He needs to gain everything. Everything. Water. So lean mass, I talked about this earlier, is muscle and everything that's not fat. Right. So water. Bone, liver, brain. Yeah. So when that lean mass goes up on a DEX or bioelectrical impedance, it Mm -hmm. may not necessarily reflect that it's muscle mass. Same thing if it goes down, it may not reflect muscle mass. So let's just, you know. One more. One more data point. Yeah. As far as bad data is concerned. Exactly. It's hard to measure all of this stuff. Can't measure muscle mass. Right. Effectively. No, not yeah. really. Yeah. Not um, really, but we all know if it's gone up. Well, when you die, you know, you do an Well, I mean, yeah. if we need a number, but yeah. I mean, yeah. if we, yeah. if your squat went from 135 to 405, that's the best metric. Guess what happened, right? You gained muscle. Right. Yeah. That's what happened. Uh, so, what kind of a diet are you going to put a kid on? Well, he doesn't. That's, he's all right. Let's go with your numbers. He's six four, one fifty. Yeah. What do you do with him? He's drinking the gallon of whole milk a day, because he doesn't have a whole lot of money. And right. Twenty four hundred calories for a dollar fifty. Can't beat that. Hard to beat. And then he's going to eat mom's cooking on top of it and yep. get to thirty five, probably forty five hundred, which is probably what he needs. He's six four. Talk to a guy who's six four that you know has a basketball player physique, right? Marathon runner physique. They have to eat a lot, right? So, I would, yeah, uh, yeah. I would contest that, Robert. You and I have talked about this several times. I okay. think that a kid in that kind of a situation needs six thousand calories a day. Sure. And it's it's hard to eat that much. But here's an interesting thing. Did you know that the the Forest Service, uh, the Fire Service, USDA Fire Service, when guys are out deployed on a fire line, you mm-hmm. know what they, you know what their rations per day are? What are they? Six thousand. Mm-hmm. Six thousand calories. Mm-hmm. Two hundred fifty grams of protein. Six thousand calories, because those guys are working their asses off, mm-hmm. and uh, it's hard to appreciate how hard those guys work. Right. It really is. Yeah. They're on 12-hour shifts. It's real hard to understand exactly what they're doing out there. Well, they're comparable to professional it's, athletes. Oh, they're yeah. far harder yeah. working, far harder than professional athletes because there's there's not any breaks. Yeah. It's hot. It's their ass that's on the line if they don't move quickly and move a lot and move all day long. They feed those guys 6,000 calories a day. And I don't think it is a, a, a terrible mistake to try to – to uh, to extrapolate that same advice to a little skinny nineteen year old kid who's trying to gain a bunch of body weight six thousand calories a day will do the job forty five might get it done but uh, I think six thousand is not an unreasonable thing to 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 have them try to shoot for it's going to be hard for them to do it. that's this is yeah. the, this is yeah. kind of the problem yeah. not not the six thousand. But eating the, the, 6, the reality of the 6, reality 000, yeah. of six thousand calories—that's a hell of a bunch of calories. Yeah. 
and it's it's kind of hard to eat that much but i think it helps i think it's useful so your recommendation would be something along those those same lines yeah now what is the objection that the youtube commenters are going to have to this what do you know you're going to see he's going right to he's going to gain mostly fat He's going to gain fat. Oh, he's going to have heart disease. Heart disease. He won't be able to run. It's better than Ripito can run. Ripito can't run, you know. Great. Just and, another fat uh, guy. And he's just a big fat guy. And, uh, you know, everybody knows that uh, that's too many calories. All right. Look, what is uh, what is the deal here? Do people really think that we want this 19-year-old kid to eat 6,000 calories a day for the rest of his life? Are you actually that fucking stupid? (laughs) You people that are typing this right now on the YouTube, are you really that fucking stupid? Do you not understand that you do this as long as necessary and no longer? Do you think, here's the better, better question. Do these people actually think that a 19-year-old kid is going to develop heart disease in the nine months he's eating this much food? Let's talk about that. Let's. So, Let's. how long does it take to develop heart disease? I bet, do you know? Probably not. Heart disease starts in utero, first of all. We start depositing plaques in our arteries when we're in the womb. And then it happens little by little by little by little by little. And men start to have heart attacks in their 50s, women in their 60s, if they're predisposed to having heart attack. If they are, yes. All of us are depositing plaques from the moment that we are conceived. Right. And plaques are what? Fatty deposits on the arteries. On the inside of the lumen of the artery. Yeah. Why are they they deposited? Hmm. Stumping. Fuck, you did stump me. I never thought about that. Why are they deposited? Why are they deposited? Well, well can, let's I, talk I, I, about I, I, that I, I, because if you ask yeah. Linus Pauling uh, and Messiah yeah. Rath, Matthias Rath, they will tell you that, and I don't know how much of this is still in vogue right now, but uh, Pauling's idea was that uh, the vitamin C thing, notwithstanding, his, his, uh, his idea was that the plaques, and this is not just Pauling, this is lots and lots of people have understood that those plaques are in response to uh, oxidative yeah, damage yeah, yeah. within the artery, and the plaque is a patch That's for that. damage to the artery's lumen, and it is a mm-hmm. functional response to oxidative damage. Now, if you take that one step further, uh, I remember Pauling this. said that that oxidative damage was mitigated by vitamin C supplementation, and he advocated high doses. That's less interesting to me than the fact that high serum cholesterol or the presence of cholesterol in your blood is absolutely normal. It is an it is a function of mm-hmm. a, a normally functioning cardiovascular system. It is a problem only at extremely high levels of of cholesterol and even elevated cholesterol levels are not indicative of any process that might lead to heart disease. And, you know, I, I don't, uh, I, you know, I, I am aware of the uh, total mortality curves Mm -hmm. that correlate to serum cholesterol. The sweet spot, the lowest total mortality, is at about 190, 180, 190. And the tails, Mm -hmm. very low cholesterol and extremely high cholesterol Mm -hmm. are where the mortality concentrates. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, in other words, low low serum cholesterol is inability to repair the damage. Very, very, very high hypercholesterolemia is indicative of an over response to the oxidative damage that that is harmful in and of itself 
but the but cholesterol itself is a perfectly and placking is a perfectly normal response mm-hmm. to having blood run through your arteries. Yeah. So you right. did, I, I guess I just didn't understand your question for some yeah. reason, but it all kind of came back to me. Right. So what what are this what we what you're talking about where that comes from is they've done papers on this over the last 40 years probably. And what they've observed is when a human eats a high-fat meal, there's an inflammatory response, and you get oxidative damage, which is what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Then your endothelial walls, which is your first layer of your artery, become more permeable, which for you that means that things can pass through them easier. Mm-hmm. And then you get these fatty acids that are circulating through the blood that penetrate through and do essentially what you just said, patch up the um, rupture because you got to think about what an artery is. An artery is a high-pressure system. Yeah. So you got... Lots of water going, or not water, scratch that, blood pumping through Fluid. Them. Yeah, fluid. I don't know what. Right. And uh, because it's a high-pressure sim- system, you know, they're subject to a lot of stress. Sure. So then and when, that's why yeah. arteries are muscular. Exactly. Yeah. So the closer you get to the heart, the more pliable they are. The further you get away from the heart, the more muscular they are. So when you're close to the heart, this is why they're always talking about coronary artery disease, right? So they're ballooning out, and they're coming back you know they're stretching and recoiling mm-hmm. and that's because they're close to the heart so the heart has to pump out blood and the stiffer that they are in that region of the body the harder the heart has to work and the harder the heart has to work the more negatively it adapts because what is the heart it's a muscle that beats 24 hours a day 365 days a year what happens when you train harder you get bigger muscles so if the heart has to work harder unnecessarily and this is called pathological hypertrophy Right. Which means that it has to grow thicker in right. response to the pathology that's caused. In, by in yeah. response to normal baseline loads. Yeah. Not exercise loads, but yeah. normal baseline loads. Yeah. So right. if you're eating like a pile of shit for, you know, 30, 40 years, making it have to work harder, it gets thicker. And if it gets thicker, it can't pump out as much. Right. So you're not getting as much oxygen circulating through your body. Mm -hmm. And that could lead to heart disease. This takes decades to happen. Right. The three months of drinking a gallon of milk a day isn't going to cause pathological hypertrophy of the heart, which is a negative enlargement. Or pathological hypertrophy of anything else. Exactly. Okay. So uh, this is decades. We we just spent five minutes explaining why you shouldn't have typed that. Yeah. Okay. But you typed it anyway, because you're a stupid motherfucker. Okay, now. I think we can agree, uh, though, that the underweight 55-year-old probably doesn't need to do that. Right. Yeah. An underweight 55-year-old is in a completely different situation than an underweight 19-year-old. Yeah. That's absolutely true. Yeah. And an underweight 55-year-old is one of these people for whom we do not recommend a gallon of milk a day. Uh, but what will we do with a guy? I, it's obvious what we do with a 19 year old kid. Mm-hmm. We have him go to the golden corral three days a week and get thrown out. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. He needs to eat way more than he's been eating. He's not eating enough. How do we know that? Because he's six, four and one fifty. Picture that picture six, four, one fifty. Look I, it up. Once, I, once I had a kid in the gym that came into gym, he was like 5'11", and he was 128 pounds when he got there. And I put, we put, I yelled at him and screamed and yelled at his ass about this and got him up to 148, yeah. put 20 pounds on him. You couldn't tell. I believe, couldn't yeah, tell. yeah. Couldn't tell he gained a pound. It's the damnedest thing you ever saw. And a guy like that needs to go get thrown out of the Golden Corral. He needs a gallon and a half of milk a day wouldn't hurt if he drank a gallon of milk a day and added a quart of half and half to it. Mm-hmm. You know, drink a half a cup of olive oil at night before you went to bed. Doesn't matter. Just, you know, crash weight gain diet. He's six Because he's not going to yeah. do it the rest of his life. He's 19. He's not going to get heart disease. And shut up. All right? Just, you know, stop typing. But a 55-year-old guy, now, he needs to get, he's, he's 5'11", he's 180 pounds, mm-hmm. 170 pounds. He's underweight. Mm-hmm. As hard as it is for you guys to, to wrap your heads around, a guy 5'11", 55 years old, it's 170, 
is underweight. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a friend uh, who is in exactly this situation. He's 69, works his ass off every day outside. He's 5'11". He probably weighs 160. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not happy with that. I'm not happy with that. A guy that old at that body weight gets pneumonia. He's going to go down to 120. He's in trouble. Yeah, if he survives it. If he survives the, if yeah. he survives the illness. Mm -hmm. A guy that's 5'11", that's 220 that gets pneumonia, mm -hmm. is sick for a couple of weeks. And he's all right. But, but I'm worried about my little skinny buddy getting sick at that age, that kind you know, illnesses that uh, a heavier man gets through easily, you know, skinny guy can't fight off. Mm -hmm. So if he's 170 and he's 5'11", what do you do? And he's 55, what do you do? Well, you increase his calories a little bit slower and you don't feed him as much fat or he's not going to need that many calories first of all right he's not a lumberjack well, um and i got another point on that he's not going to need as many calories as his 18 year old self you know 40 years ago right <laughs> or 30 years ago um so he's not gonna why is that because metabolic rate slows down with age right <laughs> that's why we tend i know all of you don't want to believe this but if you look at body weights of people from various decades of age they increase we gain body weight with age right. in the absence of any training. It just happens because— Even while we lose muscle mass. And we're not the only ones that do this. Animals do it, too. Sure. Yeah, animals get fatter with age. Yes. Because, like a car, the more you drive a car, things tend to wear out. You know, your mm -hmm. pancreas doesn't work as well. You become more insulin resistant. That's why diabetes in people over 70 is almost considered normal. You know, you mm -hmm. tend to become more insulin resistant because pancreas isn't working as well. Heart's not working as well. That's why heart disease tends to happen in older age, you know. Not everybody's going to get a heart attack. Not everybody's going to get diabetes, but everything tends to slow down. Right. Right? So everything do. just with age heads in that direction, whether it gets there or not. Yeah. Right. Even like you've talked about with muscle mass, we all, we're all going to lose it. You know, training bends the curve. We're not curing sarcopenia. We're, Isn't it interesting yeah. that this, this phenomena keeps coming up? If you lose body weight, you're losing from the whole system, lean muscle mass and body fat. You gain body weight. You're gaining the whole system gain. Interesting. You can skew the, you can skew the percentages, mm -hmm. but the whole thing responds. As you get older, things happen to the whole system. The system as a whole responds to age, and while you can skew – the response in a certain direction, mm -hmm. you have absolutely no way to completely mitigate those effects mm -hmm. because as you age, things slow down, things change. As you age, for example, your uh, connective tissue composition changes, mm -hmm. right? Your tendons and ligaments get get less elastic. Mm -hmm. they, they're, they're, you know, what would be plastic de the, the the elastic deformation mm -hmm. ability of a tendon or a ligament changes as you get older, and it you're not as sprawling as you get older. Mm -hmm. The whole system is always has to be concerned. You don't just burn fat mm -hmm. during exercise. You don't just burn carbohydrate mm -hmm. or just burn ATP. Everything in the human body is complicated and multivariate. And mm -hmm. simple assessments of these things are always wrong. Yeah. What's interesting is typically when you lose weight, you lose fat and muscle. What has been observed, and I'm sure you've seen it, in an elderly population, they tend to lose mostly muscle. Yes. And the fat loss is unnoticeable. Muscle yeah. is easier to metabolize into carbohydrate mm -hmm. than fat. Mm -hmm. And as you get less good at doing those kinds of metabolic tasks as you get older, weight loss skews toward fat. This is why I'm worried about my 69-year-old skinny buddy. Yeah. You know? And he's outside all day. Yeah. Which means he's probably not thinking about eating. He's not eating. Yeah, exactly. 
and he knows he's not eating, and he just can't. That's another. You know, yeah, it's a it's a it's a bad situation. I'm tired of yelling at him. Mm-hmm. You know, I just now I just worry about him. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so we're gonna increase his carbs slowly, right? Like a five percent increase, increase his fat as well. Mm-hmm. Make sure his He's eating protein every few hours and a reasonably equal amount because this person is probably at risk for some insulin resistance over the next decade. He could be, yeah. but by the same token, as you lifting. get older, mm-hmm. your appetite goes down. Yeah. I certainly have noticed that myself. Yeah. I still eat too much. But, uh, God, when I was 28, oh, shit, you know, I could eat a two-pound steak with absolutely no trouble at all. And my eyes are, you know, when I go to the store to buy stuff, my eyes are still 28. <laughs> I make this mistake all the time. I can't eat all that shit anymore. <laughs> but I still, but, but I bought it. It looked like about the right size. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, as you get older, you, yeah. your, your appetite goes down. So a guy, in, an older guy trying to gain weight is going to have to, you're, he's going to eat smaller portions. Mm-hmm. Than a younger guy. Yeah. Our 19-year-old kid can fix this weight gain thing yeah. a whole lot easier than an older guy that needs to gain some weight. He's just going to whine, but he'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 18-year-old kid will whine and piss and moan about having to drink all this milk and everything. But, you know, as he starts to fill out his clothes better and he looks more like a human male, uh, he will respond positively to that and figure out a way to keep doing it. Mm-hmm. An older guy who really desperately needs to be above 200 pounds mm-hmm. just so that if he gets in a car wreck mm-hmm. and is laid up in the hospital, he can survive it better than a than somebody that, that a, such a, an event would otherwise kill, mm-hmm. right? And the medical community doesn't entirely disagree because they have – when I was finishing up my dietetic internship, they had instructed us, do not address BMIs from 25 to 30 in elderly adults. Right. Yeah, because they find that mortality rates are higher, you know, when the BMI is lower. And now we've got even more data on that in other populations, but it's especially true in older. And I, I think the the data now points to the lowest total mortality within the cohort from 25 to 30 BMI, mm-hmm. which would be overweight. Mm-hmm. Isn't that what they call overweight? Yep. Just before obese. Yep. That's total mortality at its lowest in that, yeah. in that, in that group. Mm-hmm. So you, right. U-shaped curve. Right. So people start, you know, bantering with each other in the middle. So picture the letter U. Just like, yeah. just like the cholesterol yeah. curve. Yeah. So in, on the extreme end, BMI is 17. On the uh, tails, yeah. skinny people die. Everybody agrees. Really giant, fat people. Giant yeah. fat people. So, right. Yeah. Some people start right. bickering about where the sweet spot is. The sweet spot is yeah. not where the abs are. No. You're more likely to die there. That's where that's where yeah. you die. Yeah. Abs are deadly. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, you, you want a little bit of belly. Yeah. Sorry. Data's out there. If you're, if you're concerned about longevity, you want a little bit of belly. You really do. And if you, I can see him typing. I can see him typing. I'd rather die than look like you. I'd rather die than look like Ripto, because Ripto's a big fat guy. Right. <laughs> he can't run either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, God. So, I can't get past this today. This has been an interesting experience on the internet, putting that stupid ass thing up that Nick cleverly titled. Oh, God. Everybody's good. He's trolling. <laughs> like a Del Gadeo is trolling everybody, and they just went, Whoa, just dove right yeah. into the goddamn pool. Oh, it's fabulous. Oh, man. So, so what else? Uh, there is, uh, that's weight loss, weight gain. Uh, and those are the primary topics that people are interested in when they talk well, about. Let's talk. When they talk about nutrition, when they hire somebody for nutrition services. Uh, to help them out, those are the two primary topics. So what else we got? Let's elaborate on weight gain. Because okay. Everybody can collectively agree that muscle mass, contractile tissue, is necessary to lift more weight. Sure. And if you're getting stronger, you're probably gaining some muscle mass. Everybody can agree on this, yes. right? 
So now the misinterpretation that most people have is that the muscle mass that you're gaining is the only thing contributing to weight on the bar. Right. When that's not entirely correct. That fat mass helps you lift more weight. Yeah. Try to wrap your head around yeah. this, boys and girls. Yeah. You know, a guy, a strong man at 10% body fat would be stronger, same guy, at 15% body fat. Why? Leverage. A larger mass is going to move a larger mass because it changes the mechanics of things. Yes. So you have bigger thighs, bigger belly. So look at the world's strongest squatters. Is it an accident? I mean, this is totally observational, but is it an accident that they tend to all have big bellies? Probably Got, not. Yeah. I don't think it's an accident. And they know this. And they sacrifice their deadlift for it for other reasons. And I've covered this mm-hmm. in one of my articles. Yeah. Um, bigger thigh, bigger belly. You're going to have um, more of a stretch, more of a rebound at the bottom. Because think about it. You're st- tighter yeah. at the bottom. Yeah. Tighter at the bottom. Notice that they spring more when they come up versus ever watch a skinny guy squat properly. It looks very different than you, when you watch a fat guy squat. Oh, Would yeah. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So there's that, then intra-abdominal pressure. That's the most obvious one that I don't think anybody would disagree on. If you have a great big mass here, and I'm not, this is not me saying every single person needs a huge belly. I'm talking about an extreme situation where you're a competitive lifter. What did they just type? Santana said everybody needs to get fat. <laughs> yeah, right. Competitive lifter does all sorts of shit to sacrifice his or her health. Sure. Because they're a competitive lifter. Same right. thing as an NFL player. Yes. They're not healthy. <laughs> no, they're not healthy. They're running yeah. into each other with their heads. Yeah. But so, for $8 million a year, you'll tend to do that for yeah. a while. Lifters. Right. Lifters don't make $8 million no. a year, but by the same token, they're not running into shit with their head. Not usually. Yeah. Anyway. No, but they're getting fat, you know? Right. Um, fat comes off. Yeah. So let's talk about intra-abdominal pressure. What does it do? It supports the back. It supports the back. Force transmitter. Yes. You're going to generate more force. Stiffer back segment. Why? Transmits force to the bar. What does the belt do? It exaggerates it, it, this. It, it, it improves uh, stiffness in the back segment. And we've I've got an article about the mechanism for that, the hoop tension thing. Read it. The belt and the deadlift. So a, a, a guy with a bigger belly protects his back better than a skinny man. And this isn't, you know, I've been been talking about that for years. Uh, If you're a skinny guy with a bad back, you have a glass back, you tweak your back all the time. Mm -hmm. The two things that you need to do to make that stop happening, and it's a pain in the ass. I've been there. I understand it's distracting. It makes it hard to work. It's your back hurts all the time like that. The first two things you do are one, you stop doing sit ups and back extensions. Mm-hmm. Quit wiggling it around. Your squats and your deadlifts make the muscles that support the spine stronger. And the second thing you do is gain some weight. Get a bigger waist. Whether it's muscle and some of it's going to be muscle whether it's fat it's going to support your back better if you've got a thicker waist hear him typing ripto just said a 60 inch waist that's what he said (laughs) that's what he said i hear him typing Uh, ripto just said that santana agreed with him santana agreed with him god what kind of rd is this yeah how can you call kind of a professional how do you call yourself a registered dietitian i need to revoke his credentials that's get that process started (laughs) so with respect to i mean you're a dietitian Mm -hmm. you think about meal plans Mm -hmm. how do you plan meals what what does a meal plan look like for a guy who's training that wants to lose uh some body fat what does he eat that's an excellent question what does it look like what is what does the (laughs) table look like because we can talk about these these things in in terms of macronutrients and and all this other you know theoretical shit, but what what does it look like for a guy like that to eat? What does he go to the store and buy? What does he cook? What what's a day's meals look like? 
let's first cover who should be doing this because this is going to be different okay. depending on advancement level. So in the absence of being an obese novice, novice should not be concerned with this stuff. We can agree on that, right? right. Yeah. So we're just not even going to cover what the novice needs to do. Right. So we're assuming that you've been training for a while, gotten reasonably strong, got some fluff on from the gallon of milk. We need to clean that up, right? So a meal plan, the easiest thing to address first are just your extraneous fats, right? So we're going to cut the whole milk down to 1%. 2% non-fat depending on palate because not if he's going to drink milk at all if he's even going to continue drinking it right but that's an easy way to change something because one thing we got to understand is diet is heavily behavioral right yeah right there's a lot of psychology involved yes so I don't like to change variables too quickly so this guy right. who's 6'5 he's now 250 his gut got a little too big in the process but he's an intermediate he's squatting you know 450 he's deadlift in 500 525 he's pretty strong now so, right but now he wants to clean up the belly right and it, he should as he should so first right. thing i'm going to do he's going from whole milk the two percent maybe non-fat maybe low fat you know <laughs> i know it's, I can't yeah. stand it. a lot of people milk Ooh. a lot of people can't so we might just get rid of the milk altogether right. and try to substitute whole foods well if he gets rid of the milk altogether mm-hmm. He's now produced a thousand calorie deficit, assuming he's drinking a half gallon a day. Yeah. He's produced a thousand calorie deficit without doing anything else. Mm-hmm. Is that advisable or you want him to slide down more slowly than that? I want him to replace that protein. That's why I said we're gonna right. substitute. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. He's, he's gonna right. keep that protein that he was getting, the hundred and twenty eight grams, but he's probably eating five hundred carbs if he's eating a hundred and ninety two from the milk and a diet. Right. So now we're gonna drop those to three hundred, which for most, they can still train on that. You know? Right. You're sure. not going to see a huge drop going from 500 right. to 300. And we're cutting a bunch of fat out. So he's probably going to drop real fast the first week. And then uh, it'll level off at some point. We might have to take it down even more. What he doesn't need to do, unless he's going to compete in bodybuilding, is get to 9% body fat. No. Yeah. No. You know? That's not a good idea. No, for, really, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a very narrow special interest group. Yeah. And... Uh, I know all you people on the internet think you want to be 9% body fat, but you don't know what 9% body fat looks like. And you don't know how hard it is for a person of normal body composition to get down there. It's a full-time job. I've done it. And it's... Yeah. it's. I did it one time. I got to mm-hmm. 11, and I'm like, I'm done with this. That was the end of right. that. Right. And, and you're not a fat guy to begin no. with. No. And it's... Uh, yeah. But that, that's a that's a whole different consideration. It's yeah. outside the scope of this. Yeah. Outside the scope of this discussion. So uh, let's talk about let, let's yeah. let's talk about what the guy, what is his what is it what does it look like? What does he eat for breakfast? So okay, that's yeah. So, um, well, this this the reason I'm like hesitating here is because it's highly dependent. So an Indian right. Indian guy is gonna have a different set of meal plan than I've dealt with a lot of different demographics right. because so, of yeah. the differences the cultural in cuisine preference and this yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. So let's but just, let's say uh, you've yeah. got just uh, no cultural considerations yeah. here. Uh, How many eggs does he eat for breakfast? So he's probably gonna stick to two to four eggs. Or maybe right. I'll do half eggs, half whites to get some of the fat calories out. Right. He's gonna have oatmeal or some sort of grain couple pieces of toast you know maybe cereal if you like cereal right and uh you know a piece of fruit you know apple banana maybe cereal. Some berries but since he's dropped the milk he has to put beer on his cereal exactly we said that's what serious people do. he's very serious yeah no you know he's went from 16 cups of milk to one cup in his cereal now you know he can still have milk beer's not bad on raisin bread really should i try this what kind of beer doesn't matter yeah doesn't matter Oh, Lone Star. Yeah. Lone Star and your raisin bread. And then the guy. What Guinness would be like on raisin? That might oh, be pretty man. good. Maybe oatmeal. That might work. That might work in oatmeal. <laughs> Let's go make that. Yeah. It'd be part two to your protein shake video. In fact, <laughs> it's worth, it, worth exploring. <laughs> Ripto said. <laughs> so that's pretty standard breakfast. Right. Right. And then people start to have problems throughout the day. Now this guy's been training a while. He's got a job. Right. <laughs> right? So he's not going to be sitting at mom's house taking stuff in the cupboard sure. anymore. You know, so typically I'm recommending easy 
dry goods for him to have on him so he doesn't miss a bunch of meals. Because remember, mm-hmm. he's still a fast metabolizer. You know? Yeah, he's he, a young man. He's at risk of losing muscle faster than the fat guy. Right. Right? So my typical go-to recommendation are beef jerky, you know, Greek yogurt or Siggy's, the Icelandic stuff, because it's higher in protein. So one cup has 15 grams versus that yo plate nonsense of 2 grams of protein, 30 grams of sugar. Man, I think cottage cheese is an that, underappreciated That's an commodity. option, too, yeah. Very high in protein, yep. not much money, mm-hmm. open it, eat it with a spoon. But Ribito, what about sodium? I'm going to get high blood pressure. In cottage cheese? It's pretty high. <laughs> so, in the absence of... Do you, yeah. do you really <laughs> believe... I thought that sodium thing had, yeah. had gone away. For us? Is that a... I mean, does the, the population in, at large still believe that... Sodium causes high blood pressure? Probably. They're more concerned that the body weight goes up. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, anyways. All right, anyway. So, yeah, cottage uh, cheese is perfectly acceptable. All right. Yeah. Um, and packaged lunch meat. Packaged lunch oh, meat. Or sodium again. Oh, sodium, man. You know, you can go to Walmart and get a one pound package of turkey breast yeah. for three ninety eight. Yeah. And if he has a way to refrigerate oh, that, that's yeah. just. You know, that's incalculably handy, mm-hmm. right? Um, so there's various protein. We have more protein supplements now than ever. When I first started doing this, they, were, you know, we just had bars and a couple mm-hmm. bars and powders. Right. Now there's, like, protein chips, you know, for people who like chips and things like that. There's yep. Your bars, your brownies, uh, your cookies. So just carrying stuff like that around, keeping it handy, that tends to help. Um, and then, you know, the old-fashioned protein shake. You know, right. Keep protein powder at work or in the car. Whey you know? protein isolate. Yeah. High-quality stuff. Yeah. Cheap, easy to do. You that, know, it's I, it's not really a supplement. It should be regarded as a food. Yeah, I would you say know? so. Yeah. Comes from milk, you know. Right. And what do the meals look like? So then those are for when he's between meals and he needs right. to grab something really fast because that's usually the complaint I get from people. It's like, oh, I didn't eat for nine hours because I couldn't grab anything that was high in protein. So those, right. are, those are the things you want to have in your little handy bag. Then for lunch, might have a sandwich, you know, with the pound of lunch meat you just mentioned. You know, right. he can make himself a sandwich or, you know, he can pack a pre-made meal, you know, like a... Uh, I used to have pasta and ground beef with some pasta sauce on it, throw a little bit of cheese. Um, I also used to just mix ground meat with rice and um, vegetables. So my favorite vegetables to put in there was like sautéed uh, bell peppers and onions that I would sauté. Well, let's yeah. let's plug our friend Stan Efferding's stuff. Six, the six vertical and, yeah. diet, Stan Efferding's vertical diet yeah. stuff. He sells uh, conveniently packaged little uh, little tubs of uh, beef and rice mm-hmm. and potatoes. That's exactly how I used and, to do it. And it's, yeah, yeah just <laughs> little, uh, they're frozen, six minutes in the microwave, mm-hmm. excellent. They all need salt, you know. They got to have salt because they don't put any salt in them, but that's your job. Yeah. And uh, uh, you ought to investigate that. The vertical diet, Stan Efforting. He does it. Th- that, those are, we keep them at the gym. We yeah. eat them all the time. So I was, I was just thinking about yep. that because I was doing that intuitively. Then when sure. I met him at the seminar back in January, I right. ordered them and I'm like, well, this is exactly what I know. I don't have to do the work, you know? Right. And it saved me a whole bunch of time. Right. Um, now, what if the guy can't heat that up? What does he got to do? Well, he's yeah. going to have to make other plans. Yeah. Know? So he's got to look around what's available. Right. What's you, available. Could, because you can go to a fast food restaurant and get something useful. You can go to Subway, and I personally like getting the salads, not because I'm being a health nut. You get more stuff in them. You know? Well, this is what I do yeah. at Subway. Yeah. I'll have them skinny the bread. Yeah. And you don't know what that means. They'll, If you ask them to do this, mm-hmm. they'll pull the inside of the bread out and throw it away. So basically it's just a piece of crust mm-hmm. holding the sandwich together. And then I'll get a Subway club with mm-hmm. – uh, Triple meat, mm-hmm. triple cheese. So I've done that with the salads. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to beat. Yeah, for the money, it's, it's a hell of a big slug. Pretty inexpensive too. Yeah. So you got Subway, right? You can go to any of these yeah. sandwich places. Will do that for you. I, Our little people here, the which which people here mm-hmm. in Wichita Falls, do a great job doing the sandwich that way. 
most of the sandwich places will cooperate with you on, oh, yeah. on that, and you end up with a, a low-carb, mm-hmm. high-protein way to eat lunch. Mm-hmm. And they sell fruit. They have the apples there. You can get a couple packets of those if you right. don't, you know, don't have time to get an apple sure. from the grocery store. You forgot your meal. Um, I went to Dunkin' Donuts this morning, and they have a new item on their menu. It's more of a breakfast item, but I forgot to mention that. Say he's running out the door and needs to stop somewhere. They have this egg white bowl. So it's basically egg whites, potatoes, and uh, spinach. So you're getting a yeah. starch, a vegetable, and a protein. And I had that. And I'm not losing weight, so I had a bagel with it. But mm-hmm. the thing's about 300 calories, so yeah. and it's quick. Starbucks has a couple three options. Three of them. Yeah. yeah. Starbucks right. has a couple options: the spinach and feta wrap, oh, or I think egg white one bites. The, one of the one of the good things that's happened over the past five or ten years is that big corporations that are in the food business uh, are responding to the demand for this kind of this kind of product it's not that hard to eat clean at lunch if you have to go buy something from a oh yeah from a restaurant now it's just mm-hmm. not that hard but you have to just exercise a little bit of discipline and some judgment mm-hmm. and do it correctly mm-hmm. i mean you can even go you were talking about panda express yesterday you can go there and get beef and broccoli some white rice yeah, you know it's, like, it's, you can go any a, yeah you pretty much any place you want to go well yeah. there's a way to eat clean mm-hmm. quote unquote at the restaurant you can eat out three times a day and lose weight. You could. Yeah. If you're careful about what you order. Yeah. Absolutely. A lot of people yeah. have to do that. Yeah. You know. Um, so our guy gets home after work. Right. Needs his dinner. But he doesn't really do much cooking. So some of the easy things that I recommend to kind of simulate a traditional meal, instant mashed potatoes, the Idahoan instant mashed potatoes. They're cheap. They're good. You know, they have different flavors of them, so I eat those. Or instant rice, you can throw that in the microwave, 90 seconds, pour it into a bowl. Tastes just as good as what you get at the restaurant. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you have your meat. You know, you could have like a... Just fry know, a yeah. steak. Yeah. Just and, skillet, you know, fry a steak. Yeah, and if you don't want to use vegetable oil to cut the fat down, there's plenty of different sprays you can use. I'm partial to the, I can't believe it's not butter spray, because it kind of yep. gives a buttery flavor mm-hmm. to it. But, you know, you can use Pam, and that comes in different flavors now. Um, and that can cut some calories out. So, yeah, that's that's pretty much what his day will look like. Then if he's hungry at night, he can have some cottage cheese or yogurt, some sort right. of dairy because it digests slower, so he's not going to bed starving, you know. Right. Um, I've recommended casein powder to some people that don't want to eat it, but a lot of I've noticed that uh, a lot of people opt out of that because we get too bloated before bed. They'd rather have yogurt, you know, or eggs. Right. And I guess what you're going to recommend then is that you do, if you're eating this way, you actually keep track of the macros Mm -hmm. and, and where do you want the macros? If we've got a, Mm -hmm. uh, a a 250 pound guy, the the guy you calculated for Mm -hmm. earlier, he's Mm -hmm. 28 years old. He's He's been intermediate lifter. He's squatting five deadlifting five fifty. He's two fifty. Uh, a little fluffy, mm-hmm. a little fluff around the middle. Where do you want him in terms of his macros? Well, that will depend on calorie level. So he was at 6,000 calories. Well, yeah. he's going to need 250 grams of protein. Yeah, that's a given. Right? Yeah, yeah that's so, a given. So given that, and he's, you know, he's been eating 4,000 calories, how much do you want him down? That's what he's been eating or that's? Let's say he's been eating okay. well, so 4,000 4, calories, that's got him fluffy. I want to get him down to 3,500. So 1,000 of that's already protein. Just a little bit. 1,000 of that's already protein. He's at 250. Right. Um, Then the next thing is I'm going to cut his fat under 100. Right. Yeah. And that could be just general number, 80. So that's 800 calories, just under 800 calories. So you're at, what did I say, 1,000 in protein, 1,800. So then the rest of it would just come from carbs. Just carbs up to 3,500. Yeah. Right, and a, yeah. and a yeah. 500 calorie deficit is enough to produce this body composition change. It should for most people. That's not always. How the long case. does it take? You see it in a week. You should see the drop in a week. But since he's right. just now, least, yeah, right, 500 calories a day. Yeah. Pound of fat is what, 3,500 calories, give or take. Right. Yeah, that's so yeah. seven days. Yeah. So let's at 500. So let's talk about that pound of fat. Right. 3,500 calories. It's generally more or less true, but for some people, they can restrict 
like your fast metabolizer might only have to drop 200 calories a day and lose a pound on 1400 calories. Right. Whereas your fat guy may need to drop a thousand calories a day and need 7,000 calorie reduction. Right. So there's variability here. A pound of fat does not equal 3,500 calories a day 100% of the time. Right. And people don't understand this, you know, especially your weight loss clients tend to freak out because, oh, I've done all these calculations and I didn't lose weight. It's like there's variability, man. You might need to. Let's recalculate with a different yeah. with a different number. Is there a, uh, is there adaptation that happens too? So if someone's been on a, a deficit for a long time, are they getting more efficient on that caloric deficit? So then calories have to go down. Or have to That's down? absolutely correct. Or, or yeah. vice versa, right? Yeah. So if you've been gaining weight for too long, eventually you need to eat more food to gain additional weight. If you've been losing right. weight for too long, eventually you got to cut more food if it's even uh, practical at that point to lose right. more weight. You know. So. Um, the general recommendation that I make is don't stay on a cut for too long because the longer right. you stay on a cut, the more muscle mass you're going to lose, you know, as a function of mathematics, for one. You know, three-month cut versus a six-month cut, you're more likely to lose muscle or more muscle on a six-month cut, right? So, and then there's the metabolic adaptation that Nick was talking about. So if you continue to cut longer, your body adapts to that calorie level that you're taking in. Because remember, you also expend calories by digesting and absorbing nutrients. It's called diet-induced thermogenesis. So by eating, you're burning calories. About 15% of the calories you burn a day is simply by digesting food. Most of it's actually by being alive. People don't get this. Right. They think they got to run more, not be a lazy power lifter, because if they just right. you know, sit around and recover, they're just getting fat. You know. Right. Your body doesn't need calories to, you know, for your heart to beat or you to breathe. or. Right. Surely that wouldn't burn all the majority of your calories. It's all from but exercise. It, in fact, it does. Yeah. yeah. In fact, it does. Yeah. How much of your calorie, in a, a man sitting at work thinking hard all day, mm-hmm. is burning a whole bunch of glycogen mm-hmm. just with his yeah. brain, isn't he? Yeah, because your brain's preferred fuel source is carbohydrate. All the ketone people are right. What comments. percentage of... Uh, <laughs> Right. The yeah, these guys, these guys here are Ketones. typing on YouTube I feel right so now. You're, all those those weighty thoughts that you're yeah. putting down right now. Are, <laughs> yeah. They make me feel clear. <laughs> clear. Like clarity. So what okay, percentage of your daily calorie uh, requirement is used up in the brain? The brain uses approximately about 130 grams of carbohydrate a day. That's, a day. That, and that, again, variability, but that's, Obviously. The, that's the number you tend to see. So right. that is what, once 130 times 4, 120, 520. Is that I did right. my math right? 30 times 4, yeah. About 520 calories a day Right, is just going to your brain. It could be more than that depending on your job. Yeah, exactly. Sure. That's exactly what I was thinking. You right. Know, somebody who's got to use somebody that's yeah. writing all day for a living an editor somebody sitting here thinking real hard all yeah. day right uses a lot of calories in just thinking they tend to absolutely yeah as a result of bodybuilding magazines being in the grocery store we have a picture in our mind mm-hmm. of the guy we want to look like mm-hmm. now who is that guy really well, you're talking. He's the guy. I'm talking about a contest bodybuilder. Yeah. So you're talking about '90s bodybuilding magazines. Yes. Because now it's Instagram and CrossFitters. Right. That's, yeah. that's what that. I yeah. mean. I yeah. just uh, 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. You're absolutely right. You, yeah. you. Uh, uh, well, they still have bodybuilding magazines. Oh, they have them. No, not anymore. They don't. It's moved off. Of, where did what they do with bodybuilding now it's all magazines? Women's health, women's yeah. fitness magazines at the grocery store, and they're all CrossFitters. Just yeah. Like you said. It's, it's, right. Audi belly buttons and stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, but but all right. Let's let's not, you know, mm-hmm. apply my chipped flint uh, sensibilities to this. I know where do you yeah. where do you, the picture in your mind of a contest bodybuilder? Mm-hmm. Who is that guy? Who's a contest bodybuilder? He's about five eight, three hundred, and five percent body fat. And. He is the guy in that was had low body fat when he was fourteen. Oh yeah, because bodybuilders are born. Bodybuilders are born; they're yeah. not built. Yeah, and God, you just but that's so hard to tell people mm-hmm. because Joe Weider 
made hundreds of trillions of dollars telling everybody that they could look like Dorian Yates mm -hmm. or Frank Zane, mm -hmm. right? And if you repeat that nonsense over and over and over, uh, both those guys were born. Oh, yeah. They've always had low body fat. Mm -hmm. And we know how to make them have real big muscles. They're if still they're willing to do what we tell them to do, if they're willing to take what we tell them to take, and willing to eat what we tell them to eat and don't do anything else, mm -hmm. we can we can make their muscles bigger. But by the same token, their muscles have a certain shape, mm -hmm. and those muscles are born on them. Mm -hmm. Right? You don't. I'm never going to have Frank Zane deltoids because that's not the way my deltoids are shaped. Right. You, you guys that think you can look like a contest bodybuilder with diet and exercise, I'm sorry. There's more involved in it than that. Mm -hmm. Not all of it within your uh, ability to influence. But, I mean, if you're a fat guy, take Robert's advice. If you're a little skinny guy, take Robert's advice. We're pretty congruent on all this stuff. Uh, and I think that, uh, uh, fat doesn't, you, I, I think that the most important thing you can do with, with respect to all of this is get stronger. Mm -hmm. If you'll just shut up and just think about making your numbers on the bar go up, everything kind of tends to take care of itself. You're going to have to eat appropriately for your body composition, your level of training advancement. You're going to have to accurately assess where you are. If you're underweight, you you have to understand that you're underweight, and then you have to correct it. If you're too fat, you have to give in to the idea that you're going to have to modify your diet downward in terms of uh, total calorie intake in order to lose that. But the first thing you have to do is understand that this is the situation you're in, but that strength training is the constant. Strength training is the glue that ties all of you guys together. You're all better off getting stronger, right? Yeah, and one of the things that get, gets lost, too, is these bodybuilders have fed the general public all this information about reps and volume, and you have to do a lot of volume, a lot of reps with light weights. But light weights for them is 515. Right. You know, like the one article right. that a gentleman wrote was comparing – um, Hatfield to Platts, one, right. one RM, uh, AMRAP, right, and Platts had a lower one RM of eight something, right, and then right. Hatfield had a lower AMRAP with five twenty five of eleven reps. The, the one who right. lost in both instances was strong, right. right? Yeah, both of them are strong, but neither one of them are you. No, you're squatting because nine. you're not strong, and you need to get strong. Right? Yeah. And that's kind of what we're here to tell you. I'd like to thank Robert for being here with us today. Uh, Robert's available uh, on our website. He runs the nutrition board at startingstrength.com in the forums. His company is Weights and Plates. Weightsandplates.com is where you find him on the internet. And uh, he'd be happy to have your business, and you'd be better off having him help you with this. Uh, situation that you find yourself in, whether you're underweight, overweight, wherever you are. Uh, if you want nutrition counseling, Robert's your man. Uh, Robert, thanks for coming, man. Appreciate yep. having you here, and we'll see you guys next time here on Starting Strength Radio.